In this lecture, I'm going to talk about um, radiosurgical contouring, endosymmetry, and complications avoidance. And I'm going to you know, talk about some comparison between conventional radiation and radiosurgery, although the focus would be on radiosurgery. So my disclosures. Additionally, recently I've been appointed as the uh, medical director for the um, Radio Surgery Society um, accreditation program for stereotactic radio surgery and stereotactic body radiation therapy. So after the lecture, one should be able to identify guidelines for target delineation for SBRT or spine radio surgery for intact spinal metastasis as well as guidelines for target delineation for postoperative SBRT or radiosurgery for spinal metastasis and um, to recognize complications caused by spine SBRT or radiosurgery and methods to reduce the risks. So um, spine is one of the most common sites of metastases from cancer. And spinal metastases can cause severe pain, epidural disease, and can potentially compromise neural structures such as the spinal cord and the cord equina, and also the um, brachial plexus or um, the lumbar plexus. Radiation therapy with or without surgical intervention is offered in most cases of spinal metastases to um, control the pain and to reverse or to prevent neurologic complications. So the amount of radiation that can be delivered is limited by the tolerance of the spinal cord and to a lesser degree the nerve, the cord equina. And patients with prior radiation therapy to the same spinal segment, if you offer repeat radiation using conventional radiation that would um, exceed the spinal cord tolerance, then that would result in a high risk for radiation myelopathy or plexopathy in some cases. So in external beam radiation therapy or conventional radiation, the whole slab of spinal cord would be treated. So in this diagram, you can see that um, on your left-hand side is a typical plan for conventional radiation therapy. And um, the other diagram shows you the actual radiation field. So what are the advantages? Well, you know, it's pretty inexpensive compared to other high-tech um, treatments, and it's readily available. So you can get it in Seattle, and you can get it in, you know, anywhere with a radiation therapy center anywhere in the world, you know, with the, with the similar quality. And the technical requirements are relatively low, and it's very fast to set up, and you can get a patient treated on the same day. And... Um, there's more safety margins for target delineation. So target delineation is actually not as important because basically you just zap it and you include everything. You cook everything. And there's a low risk for serious uh, radiation complications in general. However, the problem is if the patient has prior radiation therapy before to the same spinal segment, you're stuck. You can't treat a patient with a meaningful radiation dose while you know, still keeping it safe without um, bearing a higher risk for radiation myelopathy. That's the most feared complication. And there's a higher risk of complications given the limitations of the radiation dose that can be given. And it takes two to three weeks and sometimes maybe longer to complete. And there's more radiation exposure to organs at risk. As you can see in that diagram, you see, you know, if we are doing a conventional radiation therapy course, we're shooting through and through. You see the heart, the lungs, and um, esophagus, everything is in a radiation field, you know, the whole slab of tissue would be treated. And um, in postoperative cases, actually, the risk for wound dehiscence is higher compared to more focus techniques. So stereotactic body radiation therapy or stereotactic ablative radiation therapy or, you know, um, we can call it a spine radiosurgery or was actually first pioneered in um, Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Actually, is the same institution that invented the gamma knife, Professor Lars Lexell. And back in the early 90s, they have applied a stereotactic uh, concept to um, treating extracranocytes. They first started um, treatments in the liver and lung. And um, there are two people, Blom Blomgren and Lax. One is a medical physicist, one is a radiation oncologist. And at the same time, Dr. Udmatsu from Japan, he just completed a neural radiation oncology and radiosurgery fellowship at Harvard. Then when he returned to Japan, he was thinking, okay, if I can 
apply stereotactic radiation to the brain. I can do it outside of the brain. So he developed his own um, like machine setup to deliver stereotactic radiation in Japan. So it was around the same time. Many people mentioned about the Swedish colleagues, but they actually did not mention a Japanese um, pioneer. And actually, stereotactic body radiation therapy started at around the same time in Europe and in Japan. And initially, they used a linear accelerator basis, a modified linear accelerator. In the earlier days, they just required, they just completely relied on the box with the visual mark set up the patient. So there's no fancy machines, no cone beam CTs. The verification is based on plain X-ray films. And the first North American trial was conducted in Indiana University, and that's uh, where I used to work you know, back um, 14 years ago. But it first started with lung. And for spine radio surgery, I think it was first done you know, by Peter, by the group in Stanford, and also um, at um, Actually, the first study published was from U of Arizona, but they used a really, really invasive technique using a metallic, um, f not metallic frame, but you know, some metallic setup and actually anchor the patient to like with some screws and then deliver radiation using like the linac based technology. And then later on, you know, the technique is refined, you know, using the cyber knife. You know, um, it was invented by uh, Dr. Adela and you know, Peter. Dr. Gersten uh, was one of the pioneers uh, applying that for spine metastases and spine tumors. So the characteristics of stereotactic body radiation therapy as opposed to conventional radiation therapy, I think the technical requirements are much higher. And also one would require a very, very good physics team to make sure that it is accurately, precisely, and safely delivered. So robust immobilization is very important. And, um, one would need to, um, because unlike the intracranial radio surgery, you have a metallic frame that would be um, put around the patient's head and the frame would be bolted to the table. You can do that for the spine. So you need to manage the motion and also image guided target delineation. And you give a very, very tight margin around the target you want to treat. And um, typically, ablative doses would, did, would be delivered um, in very few fractions. And in the United States, it's defined as one to five, and in uh, Canada, one to six, and in uh, Europe, in Germany and, and uh, the Netherlands, one to eight fractions. And the radiation dose gradient is very, very steep, so you can spare the organs at risk. Organs at risk are those organs that are susceptible to damage by radiation. And one would need onboard imaging, either it's cone beam CT or stereoscopic X-ray as in the case of uh, robotic radio surgery. And also infrafractional monitoring. So there are different methods, I'll go over that later on. And one thing which is really important is post-SPRT response evaluation because I think um, finally, you, I mean uh, ultimately you want to know what the outcomes are and you need to have a very good system to evaluate response. So this is a um, diagram showing the characteristic of spine radio surgery. First, first you can see that it's highly conformal. So the surrounding organs at risk would get the minimal exposure to high dose of radiation. And the gradient is really, really steep, you know, from the high dose to lower dose. And, um, and also the radiation dose is differentially steered away from the organs at risk using the computer inverse planning. So treatment devices. So I don't, I have not received any, uh, right now, I have not received any funding from any vendors and things like that. And in the past I got um, some research support from Electra, but that stopped in uh, July 2016. So different machines, you know, Novellus, CyberKnife, Helical, um, Tomotherapy, Vero, which is like a newer machine, but is, I think there are very, very few centers that um, got Vero. One of them is actually in BCC in Canada and other linear accelerators with cone beam CTs such as TrueBeam or Synergy or Versa HD. And in some centers, they have a CT on rail like Fox Chase and MD Anderson Kansas Center. I think, you know, what I have to emphasize, this is really important. No matter what machine you use, the machine is not important. The most important thing is the team performing the procedure, not the machine. It's just like, you know, if I'm driving a Ferrari, I'll crash versus Schumacher with, you know, 
travel 300 miles per hour, I will crash at 100 miles per hour. It's just the same analogy. If you give me a Ferrari, it's useless. <laughs> so the technical requirements. So once again, you know, for um, robust immobilization, specifically for spine radio surgery, uh, correct identification of the spinal cord, one can either utilize an MRI or a CT myelogram in post-operative cases, correct target delineation, and treatment planning techniques are also very important depending on the device one is using, and image guidance prior to treatment. One can either use a cone beam CT, MVCT, or stereoscopic X-ray. MVCT, I think, is kind of obsolete, but I think you know if some centers are still using helical tomotherapy. They're used to using MVCT, using you know mega voltage um, X-rays to generate a CT scan. And intrafractional positional um, monitoring is also very important because the patient can move, you know, in between a treatment and also um, treatment delivery. So why is a robust immobilization important? So in a study from MD Anderson Kansas Center back 10 years ago, they found that if you just have just as tiny as like two mm of translation, translational error, you would lose 5% tumor coverage and you can increase the dose to the organs at risk. Um, up to, at, I mean, uh, for as much as 25% or higher. And rotational correction is also very important, especially when one is treating a paraspinal target. So I think uh, based on the findings of this study, they figure out that um, the setup translational error, the max you can tolerate is one mm. And for rotational errors, um, two degrees. And in some centers like Sunnybrook Health Science Center, at U of Toronto, which is one of the leading spine SBRT, spine radio surgery centers in the world, they use a one degree. So, as you can see in this diagram, this was a case actually I treated with Udi, I think maybe 10 years ago. It's a patient with a cervical spine metastasis. So, so I created a 2M, 2mm margin around the spinal cord and I look at the dose to the real cord and the spinal cord. And you know the spinal cord dose is 18 gray, and for the dose to the uh, spinal cord plus 2 mm is 24 gray. So, in essence, you just by moving a distance of 2 mm, you increase the dose by 33 percent. You can paralyze the patient that way, <laughs> especially in re-radiation setting. That's the reason why a robust immobilization is very very important. And many a time, you know, when I check the setup, the therapist and the machine was asking me, oh, it's just it's a couple of ammo, you know, why bother? I said, well, you know what? We really have really tight margins. We really need to be, you know, accurate to a T. So when you look at immobilization devices, a study from the University of Toronto by Dr. Arjun Sagal, I think, you know, uh, Udi and uh, Peter, you know him very well. He's uh, one of the leaders in the field. So he compares three different devices using a regular vacuum cushion, using like a dual vacuum system, and also using a long mask. And there were 84 patients with 102 uh, spinal metastases and the four sets of cone beam CT, you know, one for localization and one for verification and one mid-treatment and one post-treatment. And there's no correction for rotation. So when you compare the accuracy, so margins needed for verification as a uh, cone beam CT, margins needed for mid-treatment cone beam CT, and margins needed for post-treatment cone beam CT, the vacuum, the dual vacuum fixation device is the winner. So one can keep the set, set of accuracy to two mm or less compared to others. Some of them, you know, can go up to three mm. So that's the reason why, you know, if possible, I always try to use this device for um, treatment is because of the uh, accuracy. So with spinal cord delineation, the correct sequence to use is the T2 sequence. And I always request a volumetric T2 because without a volumetric scan, if you use an axial to fuse with the treatment planning CT, when you look at the coronal plane and the sagittal plane, it's very blurred 
suval volumetric, you know, the images would be um, still quite sharp, you know, with a different plane, sagittal, coronal, and axial. In cases where there are a lot of the metallic implants, one would need to use a CT myelogram. And one is, it is really important to choose the right window. You look at the upper panel and the lower panel. In the upper panel, the cord appears to be uh, much smaller. Oops. Here. Versus this one, which is using a bung window, the correct window. So the cord, this is the real cord contour versus this one. It will be much smaller. The implication is, if you contour the cord contour incorrectly, if it is underestimated, then you plan your radiation based on a smaller and incorrect cord contour. The real cord is actually getting a higher dose and you can potentially paralyze the patient. So the other thing is that the timing of either MRI or um, a CT myelogram. In the post-operative setting, one would use the CT myelogram. This was a case I treated, and um, the patient had a CT myelogram two weeks after the surgical decompression, and this is the CT myelogram, and then six weeks afterward. For some reason, the treatment was delayed, so I repeated the CT myelogram, and actually, after another four weeks, there was a growth of the epidural tumor pushing the thecal sac posteriors and the cord positions shifted. So if I utilized the two-week scan to plan radiation, I would have overdosed the spinal cord. So the timing is also important. So I typically, um, my practice is if the scan is more than three weeks, so I'm just gonna repeat another one just to make sure that you know, it was truly representing the uh, cord contour. So this is uh, the sagittal, views for, sagittal view for um, the same patient. As you can see, the spine, the uh, epidural disease there is more prominent compared to this one, two weeks post-operative. So the spinal cord actually is not a static structure, it moves. So in a study from the University of um, Virginia, they perform a dynamic MRI to evaluate the thoracic spinal cord motion and the mean uh, motion range is on a range of um, 0.5 mm, so it's not more than 0.5 mm. So this is um, a slide I borrowed from Dr. Stan Benedict. I think, I'm sure that Peter you know, knows Stan quite well. So he's one of the leaders in uh, medical physics in stereotactic body radiation therapy. You see the cord actually jumps inside the spinal canal. And for this reason, I typically would try to expand a margin around the cord you know, to account for the setup variation and also to account for the, some fudge factor in terms of the fusion and you know, how I contour the cord and also the cord motion. Although, you know, that being said, you know, there are a lot of centers like you know, Stanford, Henry Ford, you know, University of Pittsburgh that, and Cleveland Clinic, they do not utilize a cord PRV and they still have an excellent result profile, you know, for very low toxicity rate. So, but this is just, I'm a little bit more chicken. <laughs> so apart from the spinal cord, one would also need to control the nerve roots and the uh, plexuses. So for brachial plexus, actually if um, um, one is interested, you know, looking at the uh, contouring, you know, their uh, atlas is published in um, the uh, Red Journal, our journal in radiation oncology. So uh, both for uh, brachial plexus and also for lumbosacral plexus. The one for lumbosacral plexus, actually I like the one from Australia, from Adelaide. So for target delineation, one thing is, you know, when it's always debating, okay, should we just contour the gross tumor or we contour the whole anatomic compartment? And there's a study, I think this study is from UPMC, comparing, um, contouring the tumor lung versus treating the um, whole vertebral body and the adjacent um, bony compartments of the same spinal segment. And actually what they found was if one just treats the gross tumor, there would be a high risk for recurrence, which is like 35% versus 21% um, in two years. And in one of the very few prospective trials. This is a national trial, R2G0631. 
I think um, this concept is being utilized. So even if the tumor is involving just the vertebral body, just part of the vertebral body, one would also need to treat bilateral, I mean also treat a whole vertebral body, plus or minus the pedicles and other components. So the International Spine Radio Surgery Consortium um, put together consent, a consensus guideline regarding the contouring of an intact spinal metastasis, and I think of Peter's on that as well. So they divide the uh, spine into, I mean, each uh, spinal segment into uh, six different sectors. You know, the vertebral body, the pedicles, and the um, laminar and the transverse processes, as well as the spinal process. So, because of the lim uh, because of the limitation of time, I'll just um, you know give you the reference. So, in summary, whatever area, whatever sector is involved, you need to include the whole anatomic compartment and the adjacent compartment. Just to make sure that one is not experiencing a, an anatomic miss. So, they have actually um, given ten case scenarios and interested. Um, individuals can go to this, this original publication is by Brad Cox from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. It's from International Journal of Radiation Oncology, Biology and Physics in 2012. This is a consensus on target delineation for intact spinal metastasis. So for post-operative, um, Dr. Kristen Ratman from Johns Hopkins and other investigators also put together a guideline for postoperative, SBRT for spinal metastasis. Again, the same concept applies. And one additional thing is any preoperative involvement, especially the involvement of the epidural space, would have to be included in the radiation field. So you can see here the 10 case scenarios. And in most cases, when there's preoperative involvement, circumferentially, you pretty much need to uh, give a donut shaped target like this. Even if it's resected, you still need to include a preoperative extent of the disease. Again, it's published in International Journal of Radiation Oncology, Biology, and Physics in 2016. And Kristen Redmond from Johns Hopkins is the uh, first author. And so the concept is similar. So for treatment planning, you know how you plan a patient depends on the machine that you're using. So if you're use, just using a regular LINAC, so one can either use intensity modulated radiation therapy or volumetric modulated arc therapy. Typically, if you do the regular IMRT, is seven to nine beams. And there are two different schools of thoughts in terms of whether you just shoot the beams you know, all over 360 degrees or just from the side and from the back. The reason for doing from the side and from the side and from the back is because the patient will breathe. And actually, it's more unpredictable, you know, the depth of the beam, because when the patient breathes, it can change significantly. So the side, the sides and the back would be more predictable. It, you know, those, the depth won't be changing that much compared to the front. So the spinal cord is contours and organ at risk. And then a lot of places, um, if one to five to two mm margin would be put around as the PRV. And in some places, they use a theco sac as a surrogate for the spinal cord. And other structures like the cortic quina, the nerve plexuses, esophagus, those are also organs at risk. And many times we see streak artifacts from surgical hardware. So what we ask the, the planner or the medical dosimetrists to do is to contour the streak artifacts as a unit density. Because actually, it's not metallic density, it's just artifacts. So if we just leave it on, when we do the heterogeneity correction, that would result in a lot of um, those calculation errors. So we ask them to control the strict artifacts as unit density. So one can eliminate the inaccuracies in those calculations. And also one would need to pick a right heterogeneity correction algorithm. So what is the appropriate algorithm? Well, you know, I think the most comprehensive list actually came from um, the RPC at MD Anderson Kansas Center, they are doing the um, QA for um, um, RTOG and NRG oncology. So I think the most important section of the spine that requires good heterogeneity correction is the thoracic spine because you have lungs there, which is the electronic density is much lower than the spine. And there could be a lot of inaccuracies. 
so you know this these this is a list of the acceptable and unacceptable um, algorithms so one thing I want to talk about is um, the algorithm used with a robotic radio surgery or cyber knife so there are some studies you know based on lung cancer showing that you know if in if one would be using the ray tracing planning for lung tumors, you would actually be underestimating the dose to the target because this, the planning algorithm is not perfect. And with the same device, they also include a Monte Carlo calculation and Monte Carlo is actually much more accurate. So back when I was at um, University Hospitals um, Simon Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University, because of that concern, actually I asked my resident to do a project together with me. We went back to look at you know, some recent patients treated with um, SBRT for thoracic spinal metastasis. And we look at the target coverage and the doses to the organs at risk. And actually we have some striking findings. So for the target coverage, you can lose quite a bit, you know, up to like, um, 10% or higher in one third of the cases, that is pretty significant. That would result in a higher so tumor occurrence. What is even more scary is the spinal cord dose. So about 8% of the patients would have 10% or higher um, dose that is actually given, you know, compared to what we estimate. So underestimation significantly of the dose to the spinal cord. And there's also underestimation of the dose to the esophagus. So this is a diagram showing what I'm talking about. So this is the regular ray tracing planning. You see the coverage seems okay, seems good. Here, when we punch in the same numbers, but using the more accurate um, calculation algorithm, there's the under coverage of the target. So after we publish this paper, we you know, change everything to Monte Carlo. So the other important thing is so in, post, in the post-operative setting, many a time, you know, the surgeon would put in a metallic cage. And the implication is one, if one is using some planning algorithms, typically in the planning system, they only have the electronic density up to 1.85, but titanium is about 4, 3.85 to 4.5, you know, whatever they quote for titanium. So what would happen is if you calculate the dose, this is like, the cage is right there, and this is you know where the spinal cord is. So one would actually underestimate the back scatter of the dose to the spinal cord if one is using the regular um, um, algorithm, you know, with the you know automated you know 1.85 you know uh, assumption, the electronic density. So one can try to use a density override, but again, it's not any better. Again, you know, you can see that, you know, the red line is, you know, based on Monte Carlo calculation, the most accurate calculation, and the rest is based on either no density override, density override with a density of 4.5 or 1.82. It underestimates the backscatter to the court. So I hope in the future when we have, you know, more planning algorithms that would use Monte Carlo calculation that would improve. So right now our strategy is whenever we come across cases where there's like a metallic cage or a lot of nails, I mean a lot of screws and things like that, we try to decrease the weighting of the beams going through those metal to decrease the inaccuracy. So image guidance. So before we start treatment on each patient, we always do a combium CT, whether it's a regular, you know, kilovoltage, comb MCT, or MVCT, or um, stereoscopic x-ray, as in like the Novalis or CyberKnife. So this is a study from Duke University comparing comb CT versus stereoscopic x-ray. Although stereoscopic x-ray is pretty accurate, but I think it's slightly less accurate compared to a comb CT, so the discrepancy could be um, like on the order of like one mm and um, I mean in order of um, two mm and 1.5 degrees. So this is an example of
let's do a scopic x-ray you know from robotic from a robotic radio surgery system this is from the regular linac base you know kv cum beam ct so interfractional monitoring and if you're using like a robotic system it would tracks automatically you don't need to do it yourself the computer would track it and if one is using a regular linac to do it you need to do a midway cone beam CT to make sure that there's no shift, you know, midway through the treatment. So to make sure, so if there's a shift, one would um, adjust it before proceeding with the second half of the treatment. And digital tomosynthesis and triangulation, this technique is relatively new. I don't think it's FDA approved yet, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but for interested individuals, you can go to the paper by Dr. Uh, Verbrakel from VU University Medical Center in the Netherlands and is in Radiation Therapy and Oncology published in 2015. So complications, radiation myelopathy, vertebral fracture, pain flare, radiation reticulopathy. So for radiation myelopathy, um, Dr. Sago led an international project. I think Dr. Gersten is also on that as well. Looking at um, patients who develop a radiation myelopathy after a spine radio surgery. So as you can see here, although we don't know the denominator, out of nine patients who developed um, radiation myelopathy, seven of them actually received a single fraction. Well, I'm not implying anything, but you know, it's just an observation. So based on the results of this Analysis. Dr. Siegel, you know, designed a table looking at the, um, you know, the probability of radiation and myelopathy based on number number of fractions. So for one fraction, the most commonly used constraint is 12.4. For two fractions, 17, and that is the constraint used for Dr. Siegel's current trial of uh, National Cancer Institute of Canada, comparing two fraction SBRT 24 gray and two fractions versus 20 gray and five fractions conventional radiation. For three fractions is 20.3, four fractions 23, and five fractions 25.3. And you know, these are the constraints I use basically in the clinic. And I think you know, once you stick with this, because this is not based on some fancy calculations, it's based on real clinical data from you know, real patients. So he also, Dr. Sago, also looked at patients who had prior radiation who subsequently received um, spine radio surgery and who then developed a radiation myelopathy compared to patients who had radiation with SBRT or spine radio surgery without myelopathy afterward. So based on this analysis, there were five patients identified. So based on this analysis, the conclusion is, the conclusions are number one, if the total fecal sac dose or the you know, PRV spinal cord or what we call the spinal cord surrogate dose, is less than 70 gray in two gray equivalent. And if the time interval between the two courses would be at least five months or more, and if the fecal sac maximum dose from SBRT or spine radio surgery is less than 50% of the total nominal biologically effective dose, and if the fecal sac maximum dose from um, radiation with stereotactic body radiation therapy and radio surgery is less than 20 to 25 gray, two gray equivalent, the risk is basically minimal. And alternatively, um, in the original trials from MD Anderson Cancer Center, for radiation, they use a constraint of 10 gray and five fractions, or nine gray and three fractions. So this is a more conservative approach. I think either way is reasonable. Although I know some centers, they use a more aggressive approach without prompts, but again, it really depends on your comfort level. So based on Dr. Sago's study, he compiled a table, you know, including um, all comers, patients who had radiation before, who had no radiation before. So, you know, constraints one to five fractions. So interested individuals should go back to the original publication because there are a lot of details. So International Journal of Radiation Oncology, Biology and Physics, published in 2012. First offer is the world leader in spine radio surgery, uh, Dr. Arjun Sagal from U of Toronto. So I think I'm gonna skip that because I think um, we don't have enough time to go through that. So I'm gonna talk about vertebral compression fracture. So 
There's a novel classification system for spinal instability and neuroplastic disease. So in spine radio, in the spine radio surgery world, one should actually score every patient, not just for spine radio surgery patients, but for surgical patients, you know, using this system. So for you know six parameters to look at uh, location, pain relief with recumbency or pain with movement of, um, of the spine and bone elation type, radiographic uh, spinal alignment, vertebral body collapse, and also posterior elements um, involvement. And so, you know, you calculate your score and if it's 0 0.6 points is stable, potentially and stable with seven to 12, and then stable is uh, 12 or more. And actually in my practice, actually most of them is in the potential and stable. So it's, that's where the controversy is, whether the patient would need surgery or not. So back in 2008, the group from Memorial Sloan Kettering Center published a paper, but they used a really, really aggressive dose, 24 grain one fraction, and they have a 40% fracture rate after treatment. And then later on in 2013, Dr. Sagal published you know, one of the uh, landmark paper on vertebral compression fracture. Actually, it's very different. I think in the um, paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering Center, the fracture doesn't occur, you know, like until a year and a half to two years later versus in this paper looking at, you know, bigger patient population is two to three months. And actually the risk factor include if you give a dose of 20 gray or higher, you know, that is a major um, risk factor. And if the alignment is crooked, you would have a high risk for a fracture. And if there's a lytic lesion, again, it's much worse. And if there's a pre-existing vertebral fracture, um, there will be a much higher risk as well. So there's a curve showing, you know, the three different dose levels. If you're doing a single fraction, 24 gray is 40%, and 20 to 23 gray, is around 25%, uh, and if, if it is less than, if it's 19 gray or less, is 10% or less. So this is um, a paper from University of Toronto looking at a case of um, vertebral compression fracture after uh, SBRT using the Sloan Kettering regimen. So this progression of the vertebral fracture and actually in subsequently the patient was taken to surgery and what they found during the surgery was necrotic debris and also dense fibrous tissue. So pain flare can occur during the radiation and in the study from Sunnybrook um, Health Science Center again uh, by Dr. Sagal, about two-thirds of the patient would develop a pain flare. So Typically, if that happens, we'll give a steroid either metrodose pack or dexamethasone, four milligrams. And in most cases, it would work. And whether the patient would want prophylactic uh, steroid, I would ask them because steroid is not a side effect. Some patients tolerate really, really poorly. So if there's no pre existing pain, typically, for me, I'll ask the patient if the patient doesn't want it. I'll just <coughs> tell the patient that, you know, you know prescribe the steroid if. Um, he experiences, he or she experiences a pain flare. So, and for prophylactic steroid, if you're using dexamethasone, using a lower dose is not worse than a higher dose. In one of the studies from U of Toronto, is a prospective study to compare four milligrams versus eight milligrams per day during SBRT and four days afterward, four milligrams is not worse than eight. So I would just stick with the lower dose. So, Plexopathy. So unfortunately, there's been a dedicated study from, for spine radio surgery looking at plexopathies. But back when I was in Indiana University, you know, I had a resident, uh, Jeff Forker. I left right away when he wrote that paper. And Dr. Dr. Forker um, uh, led the study and with Dr. Uh, Ron McGarren and Bob Timmerman, who is one of the pioneers of SBRT in this country. And he looked at the ap patients with apical tumors treated with SBRT for lung, lung cancer. And the findings are as follows. So most of the patients are treated with uh, three fractions. And the dose cutoff is actually 26 gray. So if the patient, if the brachial plexus dose is less than 26 gray, the risk for brachial plexopathy is less than 10% versus if it's higher than 26 gray. It's like 45%. So 
when I do my stereotactic radiation, if I do three fractions, I based on this study, actually, I always, I've always done like a 24 to 26 grain free fractions. And I seldom come across problems. This was a patient I treated a long time ago. I gave a single fraction. So at that time, I didn't have a habit of contouring nerve plexus. This patient had an L3 lesion I treated with a single fraction, 18 grain one fraction. And the pain disappeared on the same day of the procedure, but the patient developed a new kind of pain with shooting pain to the legs. So I figure out, you know, it must be the, um, the nerve roots that were irritated by the radiation. And when I went back to calculate, it's 22 grain one fraction. So thereafter, I always contour the nerve plexuses, trying to avoid the spillage. So I think that given the limitation of the time, I'm going to you know, go to the next lecture because I think I've covered the most salient points.